Hey, what's up guys? Arava here and welcome back to another episode of my F1 23 My Team Career Mode. This is episode number 19 today for the US GP at Kota. If you guys did miss the previous episode at our very first Qatar GP, then be sure to go check that one out before you see this one. It was a very explosive first Qatar GP race, I must say, by the end of it. A lot of tyre wear also and a bit of a shock in terms of the race strategy with Carlos Sainz and Ferrari coming out on top with the race win on a one stop despite others you know the previous race leaders going for the two stop and meaning that Russell who was leading most of the race finished up in third place and we finished down in P6 spoiler alert now it's, it was explosive because of that puncture we had right at the end it was it was quite mad to see the different kind of tyre wear levels and how people were kind of you know getting around it you know I was on a one stop with Carlos Sainz I was very close to him uh, for a lot of the race actually and and in the end of it, he ends up winning the race and I'm getting a puncher in the final corner and limping home to P6. So uh, yeah, some mixed fortunes there, but still a pretty fun first Qatar GP experience. And hopefully the next time we come to it, we'll be a lot better and have a much better car. And speaking about having a better car, well, we now know what R&D is going to reset. And we've got over 4,000 R&D points now saved up from the last two times we've done practice programs. So I thought, you know what it makes a lot of sense instead of waiting to the end of this season to then spend all the R&D to adapt the parts why not actually spend them right now as we go just to kind of see where we stand because if there's a point where you know we've, we don't have a lot of races to go actually in the season we're very close to the end but if there is a chance of maybe actually buying an upgrade a further upgrade this season and just improving our chances in the last you know let's say three two one races left in the season after this one then why not? Because, you know, Qatar, we did well to limit the damage to McLaren because Fernando Alonso DNF'd. Lando Norris had his own issues with mechanical issues. But we just can't guarantee McLaren are going to have those issues every race. And they're just getting quicker and quicker. So to try and maintain fifth place in the championship, I think we may have to look at the possibility of buying another upgrade at some point in these next couple of episodes. So we go ahead and spend most of our 4,000 points. And we've got eight parts at risk on the chassis side of things. I think on the aero, it was four. So we're actually looking pretty good. I, I think, you know, most of the spending we're gonna do now of adapting parts has to be towards the chassis because aero we've almost covered completely. But I think at the rate that we've been gaining R&D and, you know, looking at how much that cost us, I think we can definitely adapt every single part we've got here which is going to be amazing and speaking of upgrades we do actually have one last proper upgrade that comes in for us and that's going to be the front downforce upgrade that was pending on our car and then also a power unit upgrade from honda themselves of course through the season out of our control the power unit manufacturer can actually deliver upgrades so we've got a small engine power upgrade and the front downforce to balance out the rear so that's now for now really going to be it in terms of upgrades coming to this car unless like i said there's half a chance we have some r&d to spend right at the end uh, right at the end of the season to buy an upgrade but at the same time is it going to be worth it because we're going to have to adapt it immediately otherwise we're just going to be spending double basically to repurchase it so it's going to be a, a, a kind of close one to call i think it'll be a very close one to call in terms of the constructors championship but because mclaren although they're maybe not making the same gains they have in recent episodes they're still in improving they're still ahead of us and others are catching us Haas are now literally right on top of us going into Cota uh you know they leapfrogged Alpine is our nearest rivals but even Alpine are there Williams have made some amazing progress to leapfrog Alpha Tauri and uh and Alfa Romeo in recent races as well as Mercedes continue their crusade to try and topple Red Bull in the Constructors Championship as they are the clear leaders ahead of Red Bull who are now keeping up with Aston Martin so very interesting last five episodes I would say in terms of R&D and the general arms race that's gone down between the different teams as we now go into the race weekend for the US GP the two out of three Grand Prix we have in the United States but this one is denoted as the US GP at Cota with the stars and stripes on the runoff areas in sector three and sector one as we go into qualifying then for our first flying lap a little bit of engine wear on the right hand side denoted by the orange icon 
That's only for the gearbox though. So the actual engine power and everything else with the MGK, etc. is all on full beams. But maybe that means we're going to have a small little gearbox issue maybe in the race. But I don't want to be taking a penalty if we can try and help it. I do have one more fresh gearbox in the pool. I'm just trying to eke out the gearboxes when we can. Because ideally I don't want to take another penalty this season just to help our chances versus McLaren. In terms of other components... We're absolutely fine and uh, it was a formality for us to get through into Q2. Oscar Piastri unfortunately knocked out and I'm hoping that's not maybe a sign of where our car is because Q1, there have been a few times where we've been actually quite competitive in Q1 and then Q2, we've actually not been as competitive and this might be one of those cases because we're down in P14 on our first flying lap and I've hardly gained anything in the first sector. We've gone red in the second sector, in the last sector, we're just about going to maybe be on the edge of gaining one tenth. But I think we need way more than that to get into Q3. So as we run to the line, it's across the line and it will be the end of our qualifying day here in Cota. And on the results screen, we're met with possibly the worst situation ever. Fernando Alonso, Lando Norris in the McLaren, 1-2 in qualifying. If that is going to be anywhere near their pace in Q3 relative to other teams, I we are in trouble. But the only solace I can take is Max Verstappen, the reigning champion, the man leading the way in the championship by a decent, comfortable margin for a lot of this, uh, you know, second half of the season. He also got knocked out. So maybe there was just something odd with the track grip going away. Evolution, maybe, you know, maybe the track grip was going away from us by the end of the session. And that's why we hardly gained any time. Very, very odd. It's not been the first time that, unlike other F1 games, I have felt slower in Q2 compared to Q1, which has always been the case the other way around in previous F1 games. But we do have a way to make up for it because this race weekend is a sprint weekend. I actually forgot about that. Back-to-back -back sprint weekends from Qatar to US here. So we have a chance to make up for this poor qualifying. The same for Verstappen and try and get up into the top 10 for Sunday's full Grand Prix and also maybe pick up some extra points if we can to uh, limit the damage versus the McLarens who we don't know could be absolutely rapid this weekend. So we get ready for a race on Saturday. It's the sprint at Cota as we go to five red lights here in Austin, Texas. Texas, we're underway and it's a slow start for Lando Norris for Stappen as well. They get caught up in it. A lot of drivers get caught up, getting bogged down, and all of a sudden we've shot up to P8. What a start that's been for us. I think there's like four or five drivers that had a really slow start there. Albon, terrible on the exit of turn one as we're up into P7, but we're going to need it because Fernando Alonso is up in third place. So he is looking very strong indeed, but great, at least for us that the other McLaren at least is outside the top 10 so we've just got to try and limit the damage to Fernando in P3 going to be easier said than done as uh, the next cars up are the, Fra uh, the two Ferraris and the Red Bull of Sergio Perez Albon is on the back of me and to be honest already I can tell maybe we don't have the pace to really attack these guys maybe as we did in the middle of the season so I think we may be looking backwards rather than forwards uh, towards Albon and then eventually you, you, you might think wherever Verstappen comes into play when he makes his way through the traffic but this is a replay then of Lando Norris in the McLaren um, it, just a shocking shocking start it's almost like he hit anti-stall or bogged down he gets overtaken by two Alpines myself Verstappen as well who also got held up a little bit uh, through that sequence because Lando went so slow that he holds up the Alpine and Aston on the left-hand side of your screen there and Verstappen also got held up by the other Alpine momentarily as we cut back to the live action Albon sending it down our inside the Aston Martin trying to get the elbows out Albon really wants to make this pass as uh, behind is the two Alpines and then you've got Verstappen in P11 so we're going to try and defend our Albon, but I'm thinking at some point, maybe you'd think Verstappen is going to come knocking and trying to overtake all of us as Albon won't give up this position for P7. He's still on the outside. He swoops round the long way round and he's going to make it work because he'll get to the inside for the next corner. We can't make a switchback work, so we have to go to the outside of this very off camber circuit, opposite lock, almost drifting the car through this section as we're doing almost like a little tango dance myself 
and Albon still giving each other enough room to work with. Albon committed to that left hander, the second last corner into the last. We were pretty much side by side for that entire last sector as we go on to lap three out of ten. So, you know, the laps are coming thick and fast, but the pressure is just building from Albon as there's now a big gap. We've lost about five seconds to the lead pack. So this is our fight then, this race. We don't have the pace to pull away from Albon and he is adamant about overtaking us. We go very defensive by trying to get the elbow out, but Albon is so persistent that it actually overtakes us here and we're going to try and maybe re-overtake him into the Cota's version of Maggot and Beckett's and we get up into P7 once again. Surprise, surprise though, he comes knocking once again. We just can't get rid of of Albono right now. We're trying to do the best job we can of emulating him at the Canadian Grand Prix by holding up all these cars. But we don't even have this straight line speed advantage because you may have seen earlier in the video, technically now, Mercedes and Aston Martin both have better engine performance than, than ourselves. We're no longer the best engine on the grid. So that actually might explain why Albon's able to come back at us so well in a straight line is up the road. It's quite calm in the world of the top six, I guess, because it's a 1-2 for Mercedes. Hamilton from Russell, that's big for the Constructors' Championship. Alonso, though, third place, that's worrying. I need the Ferraris to do something and Perez to, uh, to, to attack the McLaren, but it doesn't look likely. They're kind of all just in a bit of a DRS train in the same train that I'm also leading as Albon now sends it so late at turn one. You saw there on the steering wheel, we have to actually correct and give him room, otherwise there simply would have been a crash at turn one because Albon was not giving up that position. We have to be the ones to turn out, but it won't matter. We're now the ones chasing after him and we've re-overtaken him with DRS as we just keep on swapping positions, whether it's completing the overtake or just being side by side and go going back to on all positions. There's just no stopping myself and Albon fighting this entire sprint race as we now see uh, Leclerc on the back of Fernando Alonso, four tenths, but still no real overtake being made there. Whereas here in my world, all the overtakes are happening because Gasly now is on our inside. We were three wide with him and Albon. We had the Aston to our outside, the Alpine on our inside. So the pressure is building. Gasly is now the one chasing after us as we go on to lap six on the back straight. And oh, Gasly spun. Gasly spun and he nearly took us out by spinning there. He was oh so glad. And the red flag's out. There's a red flag in this sprint race at Cota for a spinning Pierre Gasly. I guess he was facing the wrong way into incoming traffic, but that's a very surprising red flag. Uh, I suppose maybe a safety car wouldn't have been worth it in, in a sprint race. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe that's the thinking from the FIA, but um, Gasly, very, very odd. Looks like he's trying to just gain too much at us, and he just spins it. I went wide there. All he had to do was pick up the throttle normally, and he would have had a good run on me. You can see the different racing lines there. I've gone wide, and Albon's quite lucky that he didn't get taken out by this spinning Frenchman. So, yeah, uh, Gasly's uh, pressure maybe got a bit too much of his own good in the cockpit as he just loses the back end. And this is really going to shake things up because now we can go on to the soft compound of time. Because we got knocked out in Q2, we have a fresh set of soft tyres. Unlike the others who were in the top 10, they'll be on worn soft tyres. So we have a great chance from P7 on the grid to maybe do some work here as we go to five red lights for the second time in this race. And it's an absolute disaster for Leclerc and Alonso. Carlos Sainz gets caught up in it. And all of a sudden, we're trying to go round the outside of the two of them for maybe P3. We're all oh so close together on the exit. We nearly make contact with Fernando. We're getting a bit skittish on the rear end as the tyre attempt are a little bit lower, it feels like it, as we commit, though, to the S section, and we get up into P3 now, but the track is overcast, and the track temps have plummeted, and I'm feeling it in the cockpit as the car goes wayward, we have no grip on the front end there, then we have an oversteer moment, and that's let Alonso by, so a very chaotic restart, from the red flag, you had Alonso and Leclerc who both bogged down. Sainz got a good start but got held up by Alonso. Then recovered and dive-bombed both of us as Piastri is now out of this session. And you've also got the caveat of these soft tyres don't feel that great. The track is clearly a bit cold, but we're on new soft tyres compared to the old ones 
that Alonso and the top 10 would have had from Friday's qualifying session. So we're down the inside of Alonso looking to make amends and maybe try and get ahead of him. But another oversteer moment doesn't help us. We dive down the inside here on the left-hander. It nearly, nearly made contact. Alonso, though, is determined to not give up this position. I'm trying all the tricks in the book because we switch it from left to right. We're on the outside now. Alonso comes back at us. We have to give him some room. It's another bit of oversteer. This is the most chaotic first lap of a red flag ever. The car just looks wayward, but everyone is on edge as we're literally in the last two laps of this sprint. And I think that was Carlos Sainz coming into the pit lane with some damage of some kind. So that's a bit of a contrast to his win at Qatar. It's misery for him in the sprint as we watch a replay now and look how slow Leclerc and Alonso are. Sainz just gets boxed in by his own teammate and Alonso. Uh, Alonso then a bit unaware of where everyone is. He has to correct for Carlos Sainz because this is the onboard from him and look at this. He, do he doesn't commit to the left which was weird. There was enough room there. Then he's squeezed in by both of us but then look at this. He manages to switch it and somehow finesse his way to the inside of Alonso and actually try to overtake me and Fernando in one it doesn't work out for him, of course, but um, still, he gave it a good go. And maybe that's where the bit of contact was made because he was very close to Alonso's rear end. As we now watch, uh, this is Piastri, even though for some reason it's a, there's a glitch where it shows him with my helmet. But that was definitely Piastri, and that's how he went out of the sprint race. So we now move to lap 10, just checking the fuel. We're fine for fuel, but we are not fine for race pace because now Perez is on our outside. We're going to try and break later than him. It's going to be close, Alonso. Oh, Perez, 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 Perez makes contact with us. Obviously, we were a bit wayward in terms of our brake zone. I was just trying to go as late as I could and pray that we could get it slowed down. So that's actually on me, I think, in terms of that damage we just got on Perez. But now we're actually fighting him despite with the, the front wing damage. We're still ahead of him then as we try to keep this P3, which is not only some good points in the sprint, but remember, will be the second row for tomorrow's full Grand Prix on Sunday. We go defensive to the inside. Too deep, though. Too deep with the understeer from the damage and Perez to the line is able to get us that's unfortunate I think we kind of got dummied into that dive down the inside and I should have known better with the damage we had that we weren't going to make the corner properly but it is what it is we've still finished ahead of Fernando Alonso we've gained points on or one point on McLaren compared to them absolutely trouncing us because Lando Norris finished down in P13, Verstappen P10. You know, it was very difficult for Lando or Verstappen to both overtake cars in that sprint race. So showing that track position at Cota and grid slot is going to be really important because even, even though you've got that back straight, in reality, it seems like it's a very difficult over, uh, circuit to overtake at for Verstappen and Lando with much better pace than the cars around them. So we're going to have to do, we have to make the most of it and make the most of this second row. This is a gift. The red flag was a massive, massive gift for us to get this opportunity to get this grid slot. So let's go to the race and try and make the most of it. And more importantly, stay ahead of Fernando Alonso. Well, you don't need me to remind you that Formula One is now so beloved in the United States that we race here three times a year. But let's give respect to Cota or the Circuit of the Americas to give it its full name. This place laid the foundations for this moment and still remains the host of the US Grand Prix. We're racing today then in Travis County, Texas, where 20 corners and speeds of up to 200 miles per hour await us on this magnificent racetrack. It's 60% full throttle with plenty of good opportunities to pass, especially through the two DRS zones into turn one and the long back straight into turn 12. What a race we have in store today. Let's run you through the driver grid order for today's exciting race. An immense lap from Lewis Hamilton yesterday puts him on pole position. And starting next to them is George Russell. Moving on to the rest of the grid, we have Perez, the owner driver, Leclerc, Albon, Ocon, Hulkenberg, Verstappen, Fernando Alonso, Magnussen, Stroll, Sonoda, Joe, De Vries, Sargent, Norris, Gasly, Sainz, Oscar Piastri, Bottas, and Liam Lawson. That's it then, it's time to go racing as we head down trackside for today's race. 
Natalie Pinkham joins me once again in the commentary box. It's fantastic to have you with us today. I'm curious, though, how do you think the drivers stop those pre-race nerves from becoming overwhelming when you're lining up on the grid? Well, the regulations aren't new anymore, but the teams and the drivers are still coming to terms with them. I firmly believe it's also track-specific. We've seen some wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing throughout the year. Some tracks lend themselves better to it than others. I'd like to see it at every race in the whole season. Is that too much to ask? It kind of feels weird having now the actual full Grand Prix at Kota because that sprint race was uh, action-packed. I really, if that was the only racing that we had at this circuit, I would have been happy with that. Of course I would be because we finished P4, whereas in this race, it's a longer one. There's a much bigger chance that we fall away backwards. We've got some quicker cars behind us. Leclerc, Albon, the guy we're fighting all along. Fernando Alonso, though, is not right behind us in P5. I've actually just noticed. Uh, even I missed that. He's got some sort of grid penalty. So this is huge for us then. Because now there's a much better chance of even if we lose positions to, to, to those people I just talked about, we may still finish ahead of Alonso, and which is the main goal really for the rest of the season. It's finishing ahead of McLaren and maintaining the fifth place in the championship. So let's have at it. We're starting on the medium tyre, others on the softs. We're looking to go longer, and I reckon the soft tyre will wear out quite quickly here around Cota as we go to five red lights for the full Grand Prix here in Austin, Texas. Lights out, and away we go go Hamilton with a bit of a slow one he cuts across to defend the inside line Perez on the outside we've got Leclerc going around the outside of us we're going to try and defend against the Ferrari but we get pinched in a bit and the Ferrari is on the soft tyres so is there much point fighting him at this stage maybe not so we're going to let Leclerc buy into the S section because I think we've got other fights to be worried about Ocon Albon, who's already been overtaken by Verstappen. So, to be honest, if Verstappen comes knocking, we may just let him by. But we're going to definitely fight uh, Ocon if we can, because he's in the realm of our race space. But it's Hamilton then in, in first place from Sergio Perez in second, Russell third, Leclerc fourth, and then behind me, Ocon, Verstappen, Hulkenberg, uh, Alonso's down in P9, and Norris still down in P13. So the McLarens really not liking traffic, it would seem. They can't overtake very well in, uh, in traffic with slower cars. That's good news for us in terms of of trying to gain points on McLaren or at least maintain our stature in fifth place as we have a little half look at the Ferrari because in a straight line we're quicker than the Ferrari at least but the As uh, the uh, Mercedes power teams of Merck of Aston they seem to have an edge over us uh, now at the moment this season the, the Ferrari is fair game for us but unfortunately as we go on through you can see Leclerc is slowly pulling away from us they're slowly getting out of our, our DRS window which is going to activate on the next lap but oh that's not going to help that's not going to help that's a big moment that's lost us a couple of tenths there and all of a sudden now we're looking vulnerable we're outside the one second by the time we get to the next lap and we're just not showing very good pace on these mediums Leclerc keeping up with the Mercedes and the Red Bull and maybe getting into my own head a little bit in terms of that time we lost versus Leclerc and now Ocon is all over the back of us and I'm not feeling in a good rhythm around this circuit like we were in the sprint maybe to keep ahead of Albon we go wide at the final corner these are mistakes we just weren't making that much in the sprint Ocon is now ahead of us with DRS we don't have DRS and we're trying to overtake him round the outside and whilst I do that Verstappen just comes in and shows how quick the Red Bull still is as he gets me like I, I wasn't even there in his world I wasn't even there he just overtook me so easily it's fair enough he was always going to do it so now can we crucially though follow Verstappen through and overtake Ocon to at least get back into what would have effectively be P6 once we all swap positions round because Alonso now is only two positions back in P9 to our P7 you can see all of us in one shot here on the overhead uh, helicopter camera as we close up to Verstappen on the soft tyres surely he'll be looking to make the move by the end of this straight and that might just open us uh, up a door to maybe have a go at Ocon because he's going to have to try and go on the inside or outside and that's going to off put Ocon into this next sector but the Red Bull doesn't close up enough on the Alpine surprisingly so maybe that's a little inkling into why Verstappen never made much progress in the sprint doesn't seem like Red Bull have a very great top line speed here at the USGP as Norris finally makes an overtake in this race to get 
get up into P12. The uh, Alfa Romeo and Haas fighting each other. Now Magnussen and Joe Piastri. Piastri's recovered to P15. He was in last place or near enough after that crash in the sprint race. That's very impressive actually. Piastri's showing much better pace and onus than me. I'm just going backwards and not really showing too much pace. You know, there's a big 4.3 second gap from Ocon to Leclerc. And that's all because of me basically being slower before Ocon and Verstappen overtook me as uh, there goes Verstappen finally now up the hill on the outside. Ocon defends. There's contact between Ocon and Verstappen. Old nemesis is, remember, from the Brazilian GP those years ago. Verstappen has to stay put in P6. Ocon is the fire. Oh, my God. No. No. Just as we were maybe preparing to use Ocon to actually overtake both of them. Our race ends prematurely here at the USGP. We had more laps in the sprint race than we did in the full Grand Prix. It's all over. All that talk, all that good work we did in the sprint to get that grid slot, to be ahead of Alonso, to be ahead of Norris. It's all been for nothing in the full Grand Prix where there are more points on offer and we're out of the USGP early. Five laps in. It's our second engine failure of the season. It's come at a really annoying time. That is not convenient for us. And now we're going to wince and just wait and see where on earth the McLarens finished after I retired from this race. Yet another historic win under their belts. Well done to the whole team at Mercedes. Natalie Pinkham, how do you think they were able to set themselves apart today? I feel consistency was probably the key today. There's being quick and then there's being quick lap after lap after lap. If you could do that, you can capitalise on other people's errors without making many of your own. And that's an approach that can push you a long way up the field. So after a magnificent race, we can now see the drivers making their way to the podium. Once again, it's the Silver Arrows who take the top spot. A well-earned victory for Mercedes. Lewis Hamilton wins the US GP. Perez in second, Russell third. So literally nothing changed in the top three order since we retired out the Grand Prix. This is pretty big for, for Mercedes. I think they actually now might even be in the lead or near enough uh, close to Red Bull in the Constructors fight. So it's game on for Mercedes versus Red Bull. And, you know, with Hamilton now, he's been quite consistent as of late. Could he now have maybe half a chance of maybe looking to close the gap to Verstappen? We're going to have to see in the full standings. But first and foremost, where is Alonso? Alonso P6. Norris, ah, oh, Norris P7. McLaren have gained 14 points there on us. 14 points. That's massive. There was only a 40-point gap before, so that's nearly a, over a quarter of the points they had to us. They've gained in that one race because of our DNF. That is not great for us. What is great, though, for the uh, inter entire series and the championship is that Lewis Hamilton now, all of a sudden, is only 19 points behind Verstappen. And with the races we've got left and how good Mercedes are looking in terms of race pace, you know, back-to-back -back podiums for, for both their drivers... I think it's game on. I think we may have Verstappen v Hamilton 2.0, a black Mercedes v a Red Bull 2.0, and it's certainly on in the constructors. There's only two points between Red Bull and Mercedes, so... I think we might have a title fight back on and it's going to be a pretty spicy one between two big protagonists. But for us, it's misery at the end. It was glory in the sprint, disaster in the full race and McLaren gained big on us in the Constructors' Championship. We're going to have to roll on the next one and try and make up for it. Guys, if you have enjoyed this one, hit the like button. Let me know what you thought in the comments below. If you're new around here, then do get subscribed for weekly Formula 1 content and I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.